Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Today, I wanted to carry a conversation right from scripture, and I wanted to get it uh, beginning from a prayer that took place once in history as the church was getting formed. Peter and the rest were congregating to pray over what uh, we believe was a very trying time of persecution. If I must take us back a bit. Uh, of course, when the church is born, Rome had not imagined what the church was going to be like. Because when Jesus Christ was walking alone on this earth, before the death and resurrection. They thought he was just one, you know, confused fellow walking through and, you know, his days were numbered and it will pass. And indeed, when they had the crucifixion on the hands of his own people, they knew that was the end of Jesus. Jesus was never a threat to Rome earlier on. But scripture tells us that when Jesus, you know, is raised from the dead, he gives power to his own. We see 3,000 men come into Christ on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 when they were being filled by the Holy Spirit. Then unpredictable phenomena started taking place, you know, in Jerusalem, in Israel and all around. And it was so of the intensity of the power of God, of the anointing that was undeniable, uh, during that time of the glory of the experiences of the power of God that were evident in the lives of people and we see 3,000 coming to Christ, we see 5,000 coming to Christ and now that becomes a very hard life for the Roman to understand because it's unpredictable. One man just spoke in 30 minutes and 3,000 people want to follow him. For we remember in the Acts 2 they said, what will you want us to do, you know? And so it was a very confusing experience for Rome, and so they continued doing signs, miracles and wonders. Miracles are happening left, right, and center, and then we see experiences where, you know, more souls are coming to Christ. And Rome now is asking, how are we going to have control over these people? But also, the Pharisees also have a problem. They don't know how to deal with this new sect that has come on, and it's moving so fast. It's catching a lot of names and numbers, and it's through that that then a sort of persecution happens toward the church. You know, and then we start to see the brethren being thrown into prisons and they were, you know, tried over cases that were baseless. And it's through that that then even after the release, now they tell them, uh, be it known to you that we do not want you to hear you speaking about the name of Jesus or preaching in that name. Of course the disciples said, who should we fear? Should it be you, man, or God? They said, no, war unto us. We have to continue preaching the gospel. But as they were gathered as brethren in fear, in that line of confusion, of course, they made a prayer, okay? Acts chapter 4, uh, verses 29, Peter and John and the rest are praying. In verses 29, he said, and now, Lord, behold the threatenings of these people, or their threatenings, and grant to your servants that with all boldness, the Bible says they may speak the word. Grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak the word. And the next verse says, by stretching forth your hands to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of your holy child, Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, and when they had prayed, the Bible says the place where they were assembled was shaken. And the Bible says, and they were all filled, the Bible says, with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them, the Bible says, that believed were of one heart and of one soul, and neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed as was his own, but they all had things, the Bible said, in common. And with great power, the Bible says, gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And great grace, great grace, underline that, was upon them all. And neither was there any among them that lacked. Neither was there any among them that lacked. 
for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and the bible says and laid them at the apostles feet and distribution was made unto every man the bible says according as he needed according as he needed wow so we see an experience where they are praying and they're saying look we are being threatened we're being persecuted they're taunting us because we're preaching this name but here is our prayer look on their threatenings and give us a boldness that was their prayer give us a boldness and because of that stretch forth your hand and heal and that signs and wonders, the Bible says, may be done by the name of Jesus Christ. And immediately the place where they were at, the Bible says, started to shake. And later the scriptures say, it was evident that great power worked through them and great grace was upon them and none of them lacked. Let me begin this way. I have had a conversation many times with people who have raised in the Old Testament you know the idea of God used Elijah in the Old Testament God used Elisha in the Old Testament God uh, used Dinoch in the Old Testament God used Ezekiel and the rest of them Abraham and Moses and we see great things in the Old Testament and so somebody says but how come we don't see that kind of power in the New Testament, all right? Now here we're talking about Testaments. We're not just talking about all oh, the power in the early church. No, we're talking about the Old Testament and the New. And some people, when they zoom out, okay, they're asking, how come we don't see things, okay, like we used to see in the Old Testament happening in the New Testament, all right? And quite honestly, this is a question that I asked many, many years ago. And I asked the Lord Jesus. I said, what are we missing? Okay, what are we missing? Of course, there's many ideas and concepts that come around this question and might seem a simpler question for those of you who have been reading the Bible for quite some time. But every other day I feel the Lord is opening up and, you know, digging us deeper into this understanding because I feel that God is preparing our generation for a move. I have never been convinced. All the signs that are happening, the disease that is in this world, you know, the weather, everything that is happening is telling us something. And for those Christians who uh, really read what is happening in the spirit realm, this period is a very, very sensitive period in human history. Of course, some are so caught up in the rhetoric, okay, and some are so caught up in what is happening in the world. But I have told people that let this lock-up period, let this waiting on God period, this meditation period not pass you by when you have not connected to God to hear particularly what God is telling us in this season. God is speaking a lot. I cannot emphasize enough what God is up to in our generation. And for those of you who here are hearing, okay, for those of you who are dreamers, I believe that you can see what is happening even in your dream world, both the dark and the light. There's a lot of war in the spirit realm. There's a lot of people, even that are watching me right now, that have been fighting many things in darkness. But I believe also a lot of us have been exposed to a lot of things, you know, in the light. God is revealing way too much. God is revealing too much touching the experiences of what is happening in the hour. I'm so excited to be alive to see this you know and all I'm telling God every day is God my part my part my part you know it's just want to know and connect fully to what is required of me and I believe that those of you who are watching me would take time and seek God for what is happening but I felt that tonight someone in a way would connect us to something very special here so um, and the Lord told me this he said you see the difference between the Old Testament you know, the miracles you see, the experiences. I mean, if you read a story like a man, Enoch, the Bible says that Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him in a covenant that was inferior to you and I, the covenant that you and I are in, okay? And then you see men like Elisha, you know, being the chariot and horsemen of nations, Elijah, the list is endless. These men did amazing things. You know, Isaac and the things they did, our fathers, Abraham and Moses, the miracles, just to even imagine the sea parting before you and a man of God has just, you know, stricken it with a rod. It's just an amazing experience to imagine. 
Okay, but the Lord told me it is because they deeply connected to me in the realm that they were in more than your generation or your times have connected to me in the dispensation that I have set you. You know, in every dispensation, even if we are without doubt in a more superior covenant, we have not been connected to this covenant like the men of old were connected in the dispensation in which the Lord, you know, raised them. And of course there have been fundamental questions of why is our generation or why these generations are a bit detached, you know, from the reality of God. I believe it is because there are many ideas, you know, of reality. And the way the world has been, you know, defined and has established itself, it has skilled the primary vision of a faith. It has killed, you know, vision in the eyes of those who see. And how do I know that vision has been killed? It is because it's so absurd that in the New Testament dispensation, we have more people trying to discover a future that they were supposed to be shaping. Okay? And I'm going to say that again. We have many people in this dispensation that are trying to seek and find a future that they should be shaping. Okay, and so we now come back in the New Testament dispensation and we see that there is something that Peter, John and some of these disciples had started to connect and understand and I believe that many of our believers have not understood and that is why you've had many victimized prayers. Okay, many Christians live a very victimized life when they are praying, when they are asking, when they are interceding and all this stuff. They are always in the mode of victimization. I can imagine for a second if some of the people of our dispensation of the faith were actually going through the things Peter and the group were going through, what prayer would they have made? Okay, would they have made the prayer that Peter and John and the rest of them made or would they have made a different prayer? You know, I believe that quite a big chunk of people would have made a different prayer because we are in a more victimized society. The world has created too much sympathy, you know, for the victimized. And that has also crept in unawares into the body of Christ. And believers look like victims of circumstances. Believers look like they're the, the disadvantaged ones, you know. Believers look like they're the ones that are being chased and not the ones that are chasing. Believers look like they're the ones that are being defeated and not the ones which have defeated. Believers look like they're the ones who are being trodden on than the ones who are having triumph over. Okay? And that has got to change. And I love how Peter and John pray. They say, Lord, these people are threatening. Okay? They have put us in prison cells. They're speaking evil about us. They have even commanded us not to preach in your name. But look at those threatenings and give us boldness and in giving us boldness stretch forth your hand and heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child can you get just that portion of scripture and put it in a present day experience and imagine just what the church would be praying in this period can you think for a moment what the church of jesus christ would be praying in this period there are people who think that we are crazy to say that COVID is healed by God. There are people who believe that the church is not essential. It's not important in this hour. There are people who think that there is no solution with the Christians. And of course for some of us who are ready to believe God, you know, for the move, for the miracle, for the healing, you know, for the breakthrough of our nations and the world at large, some of us look like we are a bit confused. We're a bit confused to the world. To the world. So Peter does not say, oh, you know, God, because they are persecuting us, kill the high priest. And then murder four of his children. And then prove once and for all. You know, some believers are so, so short-sighted. So short-sighted. I remember a story of a young girl who came to me a couple of years ago in university and she had joined a certain church 
and she was serving, and then she was also serving in a university program. And then, you know, she says the Lord led her to go into another ministry, and then she approaches a certain man of God and says, Hey, a man of God, I've served you this long. I pray that you allow me uh, to go to another ministry. I feel the Lord is, you know, transitioning me. And this pastor looks at this girl and said, If you leave me, I'll curse you and you die. You'll die an early death. Okay, he's telling somebody's 18-year-old child that he will kill her because she feels led to serve in another ministry. Yet that very girl was serving in another ministry before she came to his ministry. That is so short-sighted. What would make you think, man of God, that one or two or three or ten people leaving your ministry means that that's the end of the call of God on your life. That that's the end of the anointing of God on your life. That's not how so we've learned Christ. Okay? But sometimes believers can be a bit so short-sighted that their eyes sometimes are not able to see, you know, the bigger picture of what really God is up to. You know, and I can liken it to this instance, that there are many people who would have prayed, oh, I pray uh, that a nurse dies. I pray that the priest then that was present dies. I pray that they get challenges in this. I pray that will you send lightning, you know, from heaven to come and strike all these guys to die. I pray that may you put, you know, hunger and famine in their camp so they know that you never touch, you know, the children of God this way. And there's many people who would think that way. But I want you to see what the disciples saw. I want your eyes to zoom out a bit and understand why they prayed the right prayer, the right way to pray. They said, we ask you, grant unto thy servants boldness. Give us boldness that we may speak the word by stretching forth your hands. In other words, what is this thing that's going to give us boldness? When we start to see the miraculous. Okay, stretch forth your hand and heal with signs, wonders, that they may be done by the name of Jesus. This will give us more boldness. All right, they prayed for more boldness. They did not pray that God will take them out. They did not pray that God will save them from the areas that they were reaching or the places that they were preaching. No, they never prayed for God to take them out of the world. No, they prayed that God will give them a boldness by the justification, the vindication of the Spirit. The vindication of the Spirit. Moreover, it is required of the believer, of us believers, to carry a certain boldness of the Spirit. And I want to touch that a bit more because we have believers, we have many people who are timid. They are so timid. Their work is timid. Their lives are timid. Everything around them is timid. Yes, they have a way of hardening up when, you know, occasion serves for them to act. But many people out there inside their hearts, they are very timid people. Okay? And to even hear what is happening in the world, I've seen people, you know, as timid, as terrorized in thought and mind. I've seen believers so confused confused and deluded in this season like I've never seen before. You know, you can see by the messages they send, the links they send, and you're like, oh my goodness, why would this believer actually even read and believe this when the word is very clear, you know, on what God is saying in the hour? We refuse to fear. We refuse to fear in the mighty name of Jesus because it's bondage. The Bible says fear comes with torment. And Satan has understood that. And through that, I believe that many are going to be tormented. Many are going to be afflicted because because they do not know, you know, who they are. But see, these men have understood the dispensation they are under. They have understood the covenant that they carry, and they understand that if men are threatening us for speaking against this name, give us a boldness and do more and more miracles. Because the spirit of boldness, the power of boldness, was necessary more than ever before in the time of fear. And I tell people, the church now is supposed to be at its boldest. If the church has ever been bold, it is supposed to be at its boldest. All right? But do not expect that in the dispensation of faith, you are asking for a boldness that only follows the manifestation of the power of God. That's inferior thought. No. But rather, in the New Testament dispensation, we are speaking of a boldness that comes because you know that you're going to see the manifestation of God's power in your dispensation. I hope you understand what I'm saying. So if the disciples then said, you know, give us boldness by stretching your hands, the church right now that has actually advanced years would even 
you know, speak this way and say, we thank you for the boldness that we receive in this period because we are persuaded that you're going to stretch forth your hands to heal the sick, to do all manner of signs, miracles, and wonders in the name of your holy child. I pray that somebody catches what I'm trying to say. God will give you the understanding. God will give you the apprehension. You know the scripture is very clear. The Greek word there for bold, parasia, it means a freedom to speak, the liberty to speak, the power that is present in the man's spirit to allow them to speak. Of course, when we speak of freedom of speech, the world understands it differently. Okay, the world understands it differently. Because the world has its definition of rights, all right? And, and they're not wrong, but that's just the way of the world. Oh, it's my freedom. I have a freedom of speech. I can say what I want to say. I'm entitled to my opinion, da 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 And if we are to think from it from that perspective, we might not fully get the bigger picture in what God is trying to tell us. Let me try to explain this. When you talk about the freedom to speak. I know some of you watching me, not all, but I know somebody watching me has ever had, for example, an experience in dream where, for example, maybe were attacked uh, by an evil spirit and as you were in a dream or sort of an individual was attacking or something evil was attacking and you had the understanding that this attack was evil and you opened your mouth to speak and you did not have power to speak. Or some of you have had dreams where somebody uh, spoke evil of you and uh, they summoned you to give your defense in the dream and every time you opened your mouth you could not speak. Or some of you have had dreams, you are on a pulpit, you know, preaching in your dream and when you get to the pulpit you want to open your mouth, you cannot preach or you cannot sing or you cannot rebuke, you know. That's what I want to get into, okay? The understanding of what it means to lose the freedom, the liberty to speak in the spirit. Satan knows the power of words. He knows that life and death is in the power of the tongue. Satan knows very well that whatsoever you decree, it shall be established. He knows very well that whatsoever you bind on earth, it shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loosen on the earth, it shall be loosened in heaven. He knows that. Many believers don't know that. Or probably they read it, but without the understanding of the relationship to that revelation. When I'm sick of relationship, I mean that understanding in the things that you profess to know in your mind. Because we are living a life where we have many people who know too much in their mind, but are not able to manifest what they attest to know, you know, physically. And over time, a lot of things start weighing, the weighings of the Spirit start weighing us against what we assume or think we know, and many of us are found wanting. Many of us are found wanting, okay? But like it happens in your dream, there are many people who do not carry a certain freedom in the spirit to speak, a certain boldness in the spirit to speak, that even though their mouths are speaking, their hearts are speaking, another thing. The Bible says they worship me with their mouth, but the Bible says, but their hearts are far. Their lips are worshiping, but their hearts are far. And God can only create understanding, you know, in this definition of relationship when he is able to connect to the heart of this man. Because out of the heart, the Bible says, are the issues of life. Guard it. The Bible says in Chronicles, he rewards a man according to his heart. In Jeremiah, the Bible says, he deals and gives to all men according to their heart. According to their heart. And that is why I emphasize that I probably hope I'll have a deeper teaching on what it means to shape, you know, our destinies, the future by the word of God. To understand how to shape the future. Because when the Bible says man makes plans and the Lord directs his steps, there are steps that can only be directed when a man has deliberated a certain plan. But sometimes those are harder things to express when we talk about plans and people think about these plans as normal wild deep plans of men. You know, we're talking about very deeper experiences in purpose, okay? Now, back to what I was trying to express here. We see that they understand that they need a certain freedom to speak, to be able to articulate in the spirit. And that can only be justified by the stretching forth of the hand of God in the healings as they are preaching the gospel. 
in the manifestation of power as they are preaching the gospel, there are many people, many believers, many Christians out there who would speak one, two, three, four hours and nothing in the spirit happens or nothing that happens is actually worth a note in the spirit realm. Okay? And there are people, when they start speaking, there is a presence, there is a power, there is a vindication of the spirit so evident around their lives. Okay? Because they speak with a certain boldness in the spirit, but a certain justification, a certain vindication of the spirit. That is what they call the authority of the Spirit. There are many men out there, believers, Christians, who speak only in the realm of the gifting. But they cannot speak in the realm of authority. And today, many people don't know the difference between the gifting and the authority of the Spirit. Okay? When we are in the realm of gifting, we can only speak to what would touch the hour, but we cannot move much in the spirit realm. In fact, in Corinthians, the Bible says even gift sees. Okay? When we're talking about the authority of the spirit, when we're talking about the authority of the spirit, it's based in the integrity of the man's relationship with the word of God. It's a very deep place because its justifications are way deeper than just the one miracle or two miracles. That is why one time uh, long ago I told the church, our believers, and I said, look, Jesus did not do miracles just for the sake of doing miracles so people can know that Jesus can do miracles. In fact, in some instances, he silenced those to whom he had done miracles for and told them, do not pronounce this before the hour. Jesus did miracles that were so instructive and carried an authority that can instruct the spirit of any man in any dispensation until the coming of God. Because all the eons, all the ages to come have been seized into the authority of the miracles that the person of Jesus Christ demonstrated while we were watching and while we read these things in Scripture. So Jesus did not just heal. You know, gifted people just heal. Men with the definition of this authority go beyond healing. There is something they seek to establish by the Spirit in the understanding that God has ordained them of. And once your eyes are open, you will know the two voids that separate the biggest part or chunk of the Christian faith. We have a group of folk who have not yet been elevated in the understanding, you know, to know how to make things work and cause things to go the course they should go. They only live by the mercy of those who are living in that understanding. There are people in this world, believers in this world, who do not have a clue of just how much is available for them and in them by Christ. And tonight I want to share some of those things to help some of us understand the dynamics of this boldness. The Bible says, somewhere in Hebrews chapter 10 verses 35, the Bible says, Cast not away therefore your confidence, the Bible says, which has great reward or a great recompense. It's a great reward. He says, do not throw away this confidence. If you read it in the Amplified Version, he says, do not Fling away your fearless confidence. The Bible says, For it carries a great and a glorious compensation of reward. You cannot live the life of Christianity without boldness. Some people are too timid. Some people actually assume to be bold of a boldness they actually don't carry. You cannot Leave the life of Christianity without a certain boldness. But look what he has said in Hebrews 10.35, that this Confidence, this fearless confidence carries a great, great and glorious compensation of reward. Greatness and glory are in the realm of bold men. Fearless confidence. You must know how to connect to the confidence with which you have received in Christ. This is what these guys are asking. And what happens? The Bible says the place their own starts to shake. Hallelujah. And immediately they were filled with the Holy Spirit, not as those that were getting baptized in the Spirit as the, you know, the experience of Acts 2. 
you know, but sort of like of those God was stirring to the next level of function in the spirit. I believe in those experiences. I believe that even though we have received the fullness of Christ, but not all of us function in the same realms of glory, in the same realms of authority. We all ought to function to the full measure and stature of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but not all of us are there. And I've seen by reason of use waiting on God, tiring before the presence, God can start to break you. God can start to deal with you, to start elevating you to deeper places of understanding standing and acquaintances of what is already in you in Christ and available to its fullness but is not active yet and manifested in your life. It takes great wisdom, and I want you to note this, to discern a spiritual elevation. Because many people cannot discern when they are being elevated. Why? Because their vision is cast in a different, you know, realm of understanding. When understanding is distorted, you know, your vision is cast in a very different place. And sometimes some people actually call testimony what is actually not testimony. Or some people actually celebrate testimonies of things that are so inferior to the mind of the Spirit and God that they'll almost, you know, offend the Spirit of Christ. So when I emphasize this boldness, you must understand that it was asked for in Acts 4 because they knew that that was the thing they needed to go to the next level amidst the persecutions, the hatreds that were available, the imprisonments, the tumults and testations that surrounded the hour. And I see that there are times when a man of God or a woman of God or a believer has got to go to God and say, God, I need this elevation. I need this dealing. I need this working. I need to walk in this boldness. And so we ask, how do we connect to this boldness? The book of Acts 4, it was a prayer, all right? But to go a bit deeper to give you an answer, so you know even in your prayer how to connect to this boldness. I want to teach you how to connect to this boldness in prayer, because many people just say openly, but without the understanding of your prayer, you miss out quite a lot in this illumination. Paul says something in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 9 of a scripture, and I know many of us know very well. He says something in the Amplified. He says, for if the service that condemns the ministration of doom, the Bible says, had glory. I want you to think with me. He said, for if the service that condemns the ministration of doom had glory, it had glory, how infinitely more abounding he did not say how just much more. He said how infinitely more abounding in splendor and glory must, underline the word must, be the service that makes righteous, the ministry that produces and fosters righteous living and right standing with God. Now some of you are going to realize that when we're talking about the grace message, some of us have not actually fully come to the understanding of what it means to connect to this message. Some of us need to truly connect to this and understand what God is telling us in this dispensation. He says, if the other service of condemnation, that is the ministration of the law, the teaching of Moses, okay, had glory, right? How much infinitely, the Bible says, more abounding in splendor and glory must, must, must be the service that makes righteous the ministry that produces and fosters right living and right standing with God. Now, when the Bible says must, okay, I think it has to take the believer beyond, will we ever do the things the Moseses and the Elijahs did and the Jeremiahs did and the Abrahams did? You must. But what about those ones who died, you know, and there were believers in the New Testament that did not have the opportunity to live that you are alive, you're the one I'm talking to, I'm not preaching to dead men, okay? I have exercised my consciousness, and this is something I have taken, and I ask those of you, especially those of you who are submitted to this ministry, in this season more than ever before, to take time off to acquaint yourself with the understanding of what I'm trying to express in this portion of scripture, it will change your life for good. Not that you've not read it, but in the light in which I'm trying to give it. 
Do you know what it means to go before God with the consciousness that you must do more than Elijah? With the consciousness that you must do more than Elisha? With the consciousness that you must do more than all of those folk that walked before and they are not intimidated by what is happening in your life because it was prophesied and it's for that reason that they prophesied and spoke the things to come, the Bible says, of which salvation. The prophets of all did speak. They brought it out. Okay, and the Bible says, and they spoke of what manner the Spirit of Christ was signifying when it was talking about the death and sufferings and the glory that should follow after. And the Bible says, and to whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, okay, but unto us, the Bible says, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them. The Bible says that preach the gospel. Not them that preach things that are like the gospel or preach something called the gospel, but it's not the gospel. It says every preacher of the gospel is supposed to be revealing and manifesting the things that the prophets of old have spoken for for our advantage, but of whom it was revealed to them that it was not for them, but that for us they did minister. The Bible says, and these things which even the angelics desire to look into, Angels look at you and admire you. So how can you then admire Joel, the prophet? How can you admire Elijah? How can you admire? You can appreciate, all right? You can celebrate. You can honor. And we do honor the patriarchs. But do not think for a second that when Elijah looks up there, when you tell him, oh, I want to be like Elijah, he thinks, ha, ah, you thought good kid. No. He's actually disappointed that you are in a better dispensation, a higher life, a more superior covenant. And you're asking to walk the way he walked in the covenant, in the likeness of the covenant, because to ask to be like him would only mean that you even allude to the covenant because you have no clue about what you could do in the covenant that you are in presently. It must, the Bible says, it must excel. This dispensation must excel. Why? Because it produces and fosters righteous living. In other words, in this dispensation, we don't try to live righteous. It forces us to be righteous. All right? It works in us and fosters in us a righteous living and a right standing with God. And the next verse 10 said, Indeed, Paul said, In view of this fact, what once had splendor, the Bible says, the glory of the law in the face of Moses, listen, has come to have no splendor at all because of the overwhelming glory that exceeds and excels it. He says the glory of the gospel in the face of Jesus. He says if we are going to even talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ, Nothing in the glory of Moses and the Old Testament can connect. In fact, if we were to get these two and put them side by side, the glory of the law in the face of Moses has no splendor. The Amplified says, at all. You cannot compare the glory of the law and the glory of the gospel in the face of Jesus Christ. It will be like comparing day and night. He says they cannot match at all. And to even think, uh, when I hear believers, some men of God who say, we need to balance the law and grace. I think, how are you even going to balance things that are so opposite each other, so far from each other, that one cannot even recognize the other? It cannot. The Bible says the law is not of faith. It's not of faith. It's not of faith. It's not of faith. Okay? Now, I'm not disregarding the fact that even though Moses was a lawgiver, he knew more than the law he gave. Or oh, like the scripture, the four four saying that the Gentiles would be justified through faith. He went and preached afore this gospel to our father Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Now, separate Moses from the law. The name Moses may be a, a figurative picture. It would be a representation, okay, of the law, a connotation, you know, of the law. But as an individual, his relationship was unique. But even then, in his relationship, God is saying that the glory at work on a man, okay, like Moses, has no way in comparison with the thing 
that could work and is ready to work in the dispensation that you're in and must work. Now, we are speaking in the dispensation of must work. And verse 11 said, For if that which was but passing and fading away came with splendor, Okay, how much more must, again he has repeated the word, that which remains and will permanently abide in glory and splendor because what was on Moses would fade away. So he had to go to the mountain to refresh so it could come back on him. And he's telling the New Testament church, you do not carry a glory that fades. I have had <laughs> believers who say, you know, man of God, you've poured out. Go and refill. And I'm thinking, What? What? Listen, you are living in a covenant where you must be full every time. You must be supplied every time. And God has given us the antidote of that fullness and supply. It's in understanding. It's in understanding. It's in understanding. Some people think it's just in prayer. But I know men with prayer who don't have results. One man said years ago, he said, no man who prays can die. I laughed. Because I knew men who were prayerful and died. I knew men who were very, very deep prayer people, and they died. Because it's more than just prayer. I'm not against prayer. I'm a praying person. I love praying. It's my life. But there's something more than just prayer. This is the understanding. And God is using the word must, that which remains. Verse 12 says that, if you have to consider that even this man, Abraham, our father, the Bible says he saw our day. When the Bible speaks of him seeing our day and rejoicing and was glad. When I started to search out the whole experience before God in what this meant for Abraham to rejoice, for Abraham to be glad, for Abraham to see the day of Christ, I could see the heart of a father who is looking at his seed in the face of Jesus Christ. And the descendants that should come through that seed, but carries the understanding of the humility of our Lord to become his seed, and sees what just that seed could do in bringing many sons, the Bible says, to glory. And when Abraham sees that, our father, he cannot help to think, what would men better than me be like? What would people who have experienced God better than we have experienced God look like. That is what he's trying to tell us here. What is what the Bible is telling us? And now to get in the New Testament and it's telling us, no, this is a must. This is a must. And so in verse 12 it says that since we have such glorious hope, since we understand this, we are connected to this, the Bible says, we have a confident expectation. He says because of that we speak Free, okay, and openly and fearlessly, okay. I'm still connecting us to the freedom to speak, the boldness to speak with which God works in signs, miracles, and wonders and all diverse manner of his demonstrations. Now we see here in Corinthians, even as though we were still simply speaking about the artifact of the law and the dispensation of grace and how this dispensation must shine out, that the splendor of the law and glory in no means connects to the splendor and glory of the New Testament dispensation and how that which fadeth away cannot connect to that which remaineth and is upon us in this hour. Paul says when a man starts to connect to this understanding, you start to carry a joyful and confident expectation. And before you know that, your liberty to speak, the freedom to speak comes through and you start to feel an openness and a fearless urge in your spirit, inside your spirit, to be able to speak certain things, to command certain things. That is the place where the authority of the spirit is. That is the place where the authority of a man's spirit is commanded. It's in this liberty. It's in this freedom. It's in this fearlessness. But who would ever know? How many would have actually connected that this freedom and liberty actually comes through understanding of these two covenants? Some people think that when we preach the grace message, we are just preaching. No, no. 
it's more than just righteousness imputed by faith. Oh, that you're no know, under condemnation and something. Oh, because we preach grace, we tell people to sin. I know why they think that way. Because they do not see what I'm showing you right now. They do not see what I'm sharing with you right now. When we embrace the message of his grace, the gospel in the face of Jesus Christ is the message of grace. He says, because of that, we find that a joyful expectation takes over our lives. And before we know that, we are speaking freely and openly and fearlessly. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verses 20, it says, Whenever our hearts are in torment, in torment or in tormenting, self-accusation, they make us feel guilty and condemn us. The Bible says, for we are in God's hands and for he is above and greater than our conscience. The Bible says our hearts and he knows and perceives and understands everything. The Bible says nothing is hidden from him. And verses 21 says, and beloved, if our consciences, our hearts do not accuse us, if they do not make us feel guilty and condemn us, the Bible says we have confidence and complete assurance, boldness before God. Again, this boldness comes through. The Bible says, come with boldness to the throne of grace that you might obtain mercy to help in time of need. Why does he speak of a boldness every time he mentions grace? Because grace is supposed to give you boldness. Now, even in the prayer of this understanding, when a man says, give us boldness by stretching forth your hand, the middle reconciler right there is the message of grace. It's the ministry and mystery of grace. He's simply saying, deeply reveal in understanding for me the mystery of grace, then boldness will come in my spirit as your arm is stretched forth in being miracles, signs, and wonders. Now, you see, that, that is why he says that when we come bold, in, in Hebrews 4.16, he says, when, he says, let us come bold. The Amplified says, let us then fearlessly and confidently and boldly, the Bible says, draw near to the throne of grace. He says, the throne of God's unmerited favor to sinners, that we may receive mercy, he says, for our failures and find grace to help in good time for every need, appropriate help and well-timed help coming, the Bible says, just when we need it. Do you know? What it means for God to help you every time you need help? What if you have a dead corpse in your house? That's help needed. And the Bible says he avails help in the time it's needed. In that particular time when you need help. Have you imagined God's presence on your life and what he would do and what he is able to do in the time when you need any help, whether financial, whether social, whether economical, psychological, whatever you mentioned. He's saying the reconciling factor here is his grace. It's the message of grace. In Acts 14, verses 3, the Bible says, if you read the Amplified, the Bible says, and so Paul and Barnabas, the Bible says, stayed on there for a long time, speaking freely, the Bible says, and fearlessly, and boldly, in, not just of, but in the Lord, who continued, the Bible says, to bear testimony to the word of his grace. The Bible says, granting signs and wonders to be performed by their hands. This is what God is trying to say. If you acquaint yourself with the understanding of grace, deeper than just the basic simple doctrines, righteousness imputed by faith, which is a powerful thing, but many of us have not delved into just to know that you have right standing with God. He says if your heart condemns you, he says no, God is bigger than your heart. And because God is bigger than your heart and he knows everything, he is able to give you a certain boldness all through and confidence. So you will live a life of complete assurance in God. Now he's saying that when we teach grace, the message, we're not just exciting people. And I have known this for a fact because God told me this long ago. He said, you can assume to know the message of grace. You can teach even the message of grace. You can even explain it to another, even defend it, you know, in the presence of others. But you can never have that place that proves that you know until it starts to work 
through you so effortlessly that you no longer debate it, but you are testifying of it. That you have a personal testimony of the wonder-working power of God. Now, the Bible here has taught us how this boldness comes in the understanding of the covenant that we are under. And in that understanding of the covenant that we are under, it's really in the preaching of the gospel in the face of Jesus Christ. And if we are touching Jesus Christ, we're touching grace, the message. That is why I always tell people that it's so hard for a man who has not understood this message of grace, it doesn't matter how many degrees of theology and PhDs he has, to do a tangible miracle publicly. They don't have that boldness. Many of them don't have that boldness. They cannot say God is opening a blind eye. They cannot. It's too much. What if he doesn't? It's not even in them to carry the authority. So in what you think they fear to say, actually, in the spirit, they carry not the freedom to say because they are bound in a way. Now, we thank God that these days came when we know what we know. And I believe more than ever before that men and women out there are searching the word and acquainting themselves with the way of the Spirit. And I believe sooner than we think we are going to see things in our time that we have never read about, that we have never even imagined about. And now it shall be for our dispensation to say, indeed God has worked through us more than our fathers, because that's what they're waiting for. That's what Abraham in heaven is waiting for. That's what Elijah is waiting for. It's a cloud of witnesses in the spirit that are waiting for us. Will you understand that this is a must? Because Many believers out there have not understood that it's a must. It's a must for us to do more than the old dispensation. And I thank God that more than ever before, that understanding comes. And that understanding comes with a grace to work through us. So, Father, in the name of Jesus. We believe more than ever before that we must. And many of us do not know where to begin from, but things are happening in the spirit realm that are telling us we must. We must. We must. We must. We must see greater than our fathers did. We must experience better of how and where you begin from God, let that be your doing. Because men with vision don't ask how, they just write it. And we're writing it with our hearts, we're speaking it with our lips in the things you've revealed to us. As our hearts are indicting good matters, our tongues are pens of ready writers. As we are proclaiming these things, we know that you are aligning us. And God, we are believing to see a glory that even in testimony will never have language, will never have words to say. And God ask, may it happen sooner than many of us expect. And God, as I'm praying right now, I feel men and women that are available. And they're saying we are available in this. God deal with us. Deal with us. May Christ be revealed to us fully. I see God healing incurable diseases right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Be healed right now in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I see God reconciling the irreconcilable right now in the name of Jesus Christ. But more than ever before, I'm seeing anointings that are falling on men and women 
oh God, touching this hour that we're in. And that even though our voices might be slow, but they are loud. And that in a few weeks and a few months, that amplification will be heard across the world. And that whoever is listening, God, is not listening by mistake. So I thank you, because you have answered our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you're there and you've never given your life to Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to receive him as your own personal Lord and Savior. Personal. And if you're there and you want to pray with me, please repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you that you shed your blood for me and was raised for my glory. I'm born again. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at soneroCompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.sonero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.